Hi. So I want to emphasize that um, this chapter, chapter 14 on polymers, is just a really super brief introduction to an enormous field. Um, people get whole PhDs in polymer chemistry. So what I'm about to tell you is just a little taste. Um, if you want more than a little taste, you can continue on with uh, watching some of these crash course chemistry videos. I really, really highly encourage you to do that. I think you'll get a lot out of it. But for um, our brief taste to continue with that. Um, let's talk about polymers. In the last lecture, I talked to you about monomers. Um, so let's talk about polymers now. So the first one is probably the most common one that I want to discuss, and it's polyethylene. So remember we talked about ethane. Um, ethane is the two carbons um, bonded to um, six hydrogens all around. Well, in order to make polyethylene, what you do is you break off those um, hydrogens on the end of either one of your ethane, and you hook them together in a series, very long series, to create a long chain uh, unit that's called polyethylene. So it's a long chain hydrocarbon. Um, if you are familiar with paraffin wax burning candles, this is kind of a shorter version of polyethylene that gets burned. Now, how you create a polymer is through something called free radical polymerization. Let's say that, for example, you want to make um, a polymer out of ethylene. You want to make poly polyethylene. So let's say that you take your ethylene and you have this double bond here. Well, you introduce something that's got this dangling electron, this free radical, and it reacts um, breaking that double bond. Now, of course, remember we discussed that double and triple bonds are easier to break than um, um, they're, they're less stable than other sorts of, uh, of monomer units, and so that bond breaks relatively easy. When it sees this electron over here, it's just too tempted, and it breaks that double bond, and then it hooks on there. Of course, when it breaks the double bond, then the carbon on the right-hand side, it has a free electron because the double bond's been broken, and it has four available bonds. And so what happens is it then becomes the free radical and continues on uh, propagating the reaction through. Um, so it propagates until you stop it uh, by introducing some other sort of chemical to cut it off. You can initiate the uh, reaction with something like benzoyl peroxide to form the free radical. Um, like I said, there's whole areas of chemistry that are totally devoted to this. People get PhDs in polymer chemistry. But that gives you kind of a general idea of how uh, polymers are created from monomer units. And there's way more than one way, okay? So that's just one way. Many, many reactions can trigger it. Okay, so in terms of some of the polymers that are out there, you're probably familiar with a lot of them just from looking at the recycling symbols on the bottom of the things that you use. So we've got polyethylene here. It's often abbreviated PE. You might see um, on the bottom of your recycling HDPE or LDPE. That stands for high density polyethylene or low density polyethylene. Um, so those are very common recycled materials. Polyvinyl chloride, or PVC, that's um, two carbons with a chlorine on one side and then three hydrogens hooked together in a long unit. Um, PVC pipe, you're probably familiar with uh, PVC. Polytetrafluoroethylene, the trade name for that is Teflon, um, but it's abbreviated PTFE, so you're probably familiar with Teflon coatings on your pans, the nonstick coating. Of course, that's because the carbons here are bonded to fluorines on all sides, and the fluorines are very, very happy to be bonded, and so they're very non-reactive. They don't even want to uh, react with stuff to put on the pan, which is why there's a very low friction there. Polypropylene, you've probably also heard of. PP, it's on a lot of plastics that you get. The recycling symbol on the bottom, a lot of plastic containers are polypropylene. Polystyrene, these are the little styrofoam peanuts that you might see in packing materials. It's also styrofoam, which makes up a lot of seat cushions. Um, in that case, you have these carbon atoms in the chain bonded to the phenyl group um, down here on one side. Polymethyl methacrylate, or PMMA. This is a really common photoresist. When it's exposed to light, it's very reactive. Um, and uh, so it gets used a lot in uh, semiconductor manufacturing and things like that. Phenol formaldehyde or Bakelite, it's a really old school plastic. Some of the very first uh, plastic dishes that went on the market were made of Bakelite, but it doesn't respond very well to heating, so it's not very popular today. 
Um, continuing on, nylon 6.6, we're going to do a lab in making nylon in the, in the laboratory. Uh, but nylon 6.6 is uh, also, of course, nylon fibers present in a lot of clothing. Uh, polyethylene terephthalate makes up all the soda pop bottles. So the PET bottles, um, Coke bottles, soda pop, all made of that. Also polyester fabrics are made for that. So your fleeces, your <laughs> things like that are made out of polyester. And then polycarbonate is the very glassy polymer. So spit guards on uh, salad bars and things like that are often made of polycarbonate. And it also makes up the lenses of a lot of glasses out there, uh, eyeglasses. Um, molecular weight is one way to uh, characterize and quantify some of the properties of a polymer. Basically, the molecular weight is a mass of one mole of the polymer chains. Okay, so high molecular weight polymers might have very different physical properties from low molecular weight polymers, and what you want um, depends upon what application you're going to use it for. So not all chains in the polymer are of the same length. So when you buy, say, a 100,000 molecular weight polymer, you're going to get a distribution. There'll be a statistical distribution with the, um, the distribution kind of centered near the molecular weight sided on the bottle from where you bought it. Now, the molecular weight impacts the properties of the polymer in the following ways. As you increase the length of the chain, it increases the melting and boiling temperatures very quickly. It also increases what's called the glass transition temperature, and that's the temperature at which a polymer goes from acting like a hard and glassy material to a rubbery and soft material. Increasing the molecular weight also increases the resistance of the material to impact, it increases its strength, and it increases its toughness. It increases its viscosity. If you're not familiar with this term, the viscosity is a material's resistance to flow. So maple syrup, for example, is a lot more viscous than water. So a polymer's viscosity can be increased as the molecular weight is increased. Um, of the polymer when it's in its molten state. This can have very large impacts on the processing of parts, manufacturing of parts for, for plastics for different applications. For example, if you want to mold inject um, molten polymer into a dye um, and then allow it to harden, how easily that polymer flows into the mold is going to depend upon its molecular weight to a certain extent. You can get a tenfold increase um, if you increase the polymer chain length by tenfold, then that results in a viscosity increase of over 1,000 for the polymer. So you can see it has a huge impact. Why? Well, the reason is it's a result of the increase in the chain interaction. So if you can imagine a polymer is like a big long piece of spaghetti and then it's laying next to another piece of spaghetti, then the longer the chain is, the larger those weak bonds or van der Waals bonds are between chains and the stronger it becomes. That means that it's going to entangle more with neighboring chains um, as the chain gets lar larger. And the interaction tend to fix the individual chains more strongly in position and that means they're going to resist deformation and breakup of the matrix that's formed, um, both at higher stresses and temperatures. Okay, one thing that you probably need to understand if you're ever going to be ordering uh, polymers for any kind of application from a chemical supply company is how these molecular weights are calculated. So there's two different kinds of molecular weights that get cited. Um, generally, when you polymerize, a pol uh, when you go through a polymerization process, you're going to get a distribution of molecular weights. Now, this isn't necessarily a symmetric distribution. It's got a tail, okay? It looks like that. So that means that since it's not symmetric, you could use a couple of different numbers to characterize that distribution. One is the number average molecular weight, and that will be the molecular weight very near the peak of the distribution. And then one is the weight average molecular weight, which is pulled a little bit to the higher molecular weight side here to the right. Okay. So the way that you calculate these two different numbers, the number molecular weight is the total weight of the polymer divided by the total number of molecules. And then the, um, uh, the weight average molecular weight, what you do to calculate that one is you multiply the weight fraction of the chain times that value in the distribution. I'm going to do an example problem in a minute that I think will really clarify how these two numbers are calculated. 
Another important parameter is the degree of polymerization. The degree of polymerization is the average number of repeat units in a chain. So here, for example, if the repeat unit is these two carbon atoms, then you can count it up one, two, three, four, five, six, and so the degree of polymerization here is six, okay? You can calculate numerically the degree of polymerization by taking the number average molecular weight and dividing it by the molecular weight of your repeat unit or monomer, okay? Okay, so here's that example problem that I promised. So in this example problem, there's a table, and this table lists the molecular weight data for polypropylene material. And so from this table, it gives you the molecular weight range in grams per mole of your molecules. And then it also gives the uh, number fraction and the weight fraction. The number fraction is this Xi and the weight fraction is the Wi value. And then from that <clears throat> and this table, you can calculate the uh, number average molecular weight. And so what you can think of, if you go back to the distribution function for just a second, you can think of this as instead of a continuous distribution, function, maybe in terms of a histogram, okay? So you have a histogram or a bar graph of uh, what these look like. Now here, the bars have widths given here in the table, and then the height of the bar graph would be given this way. And this is if you're plotting it versus the number fraction or versus the weight fraction, okay? It would give you the height of that bar in two different ways. Okay, so to calculate the number average molecular weight, what I've done here, here it is in the table. So I have a mean value, and what I did for my mean value was I just took the middle of this range um, and plotted it or put it in the table for each value. So going between 8,000 and 16,000, I chose 12,000, it was dead center in the middle. Okay, so that's what I've done for each one of those values um, from that table and put it here. Now here is I've copied and pasted over the number fraction and the weight fraction for each one of these two, just copied and pasted it directly, and then I used that to calculate my number average and my weight average molecular weight. So this first column here, I take my values for the mean in column one and multiply it by the number fraction x here in column two, and that I used for column four. For my weight fraction, what I've done is I've taken my column one values and multiplied it by the weight fraction here in column three, and that gives me column five. Now, to compute my total number average molecular weight, what I do is I sum up all my column one values. So basically, I've multiplied every fraction times its uh, mean value right there um, for each value, and then I summed it all up, and that gives me my number average molecular weight. So my number average molecular weight for this is 33,040, okay, because I summed up all the values here in this column to give me 33,040 for my number average molecular weight. For my weight average molecular weight, I get 36,240. Again, it's pulled to the right a little bit, as you would expect from the um, earlier plot that I showed you, and that I got just from summing up all the values in column five here. Okay, so there's my number average molecular weight, part A, my weight average molecular weight, part B, and for part C, I wanted to calculate the degree of polymerization. So the degree of polymerization, you take your number average molecular weight and you divide it by the molecular weight of your repeat unit, okay? So the molecular weight of my repeat unit is 42.09 grams per mole. How do I know that? Well, it's polypropylene. Okay, so poly, or propylene has three carbons. Um, it starts out as uh, propane, so it has, I'm sorry, propylene. So it has three carbons. Each carbon atom is 12.01 grams per mole, so I do three times 12.01. And then it's got six hydrogen atoms, so each hydrogen atom has a molecular weight of, or an atomic weight of 1.01 .01 grams per mole. So it's three times 12 plus six times one to give me my uh, value for my monomer, which is 42.09. And then I take my number molecular weight, which is 33,040, and divide it by a 42.09, and that gives me my degree of polymerization. And so uh, I get a lot of decimals here, um, but basically it would round to 785 repeat units um, on, a per, on a per molecule basis. Okay, now for polymers, the molecular shape can have a really big impact 
on the properties of the material. We're going to call the molecular shape the conformation. Uh, the conformation of the material can change. Uh, can change. The chain can actually bend and twist by rotating around the carbon atoms and their bonds. Um, and it's not necessary to break those bonds in order to alter the molecular shape. The rotation can just happen naturally. And what this allows the thing to do is to entangle with neighboring molecules kind of like this spaghetti. So the structure has a really strong influence on other properties of the polymer. So for example, two samples of natural rubber may exhibit different durability, even though their molecules comprise the same monomers. And a polymer's architecture affects many of its physical properties. And this includes, but isn't limited to, the viscosity, which we already talked about, the resistance to flow, the solubility in different organic solvents, the glass transition temperature, and the size of the individual polymer coils in the solution. And this can all um, be sort of uh, put in terms of a parameter of the chain end-to-end -end distance R. This kind of gives you how much the polymer entangles with itself and the neighboring molecules. So the more entangled it gets, the crazier it gets, the harder it is to pull apart, the higher its resistance to flow, and the less its uh, solubility is in different solvents. And that can be explained by thinking about how difficult it is just to entangle yarn or uh, a chain, uh, a necklace chain. It's, it's nigh on to impossible sometimes. And so you can imagine that if it's on the molecular level and things are getting entangled, uh, that, that really isn't going to change. Um, here's an SEM image that I showed earlier in the, the lectures of polymer spaghetti. So you can see here it's on the nanometer scale. It's uh, getting entangled. I'm sorry, the micrometer scale is getting entangled. It's crazy. It's not going to be any different when you shrink it down even further. So there's different kinds of molecular structures that polymers can have, and these molecular structures can also impact the polymer's performance. So for example, you can have a linear polymer like poly poly polyethylene, I'm sorry, and that can have a certain kind of structure. You can have a branched polymer, okay, and if you have a branched polymer, this is similar to polymethyl methacrylate perhaps, then you have these side chains that come off. So that's your branched polymer. You can have cross-link polymers, and that's when the polymer chains actually form bonds with neighboring chains. So you'd have a bond sticking between the two polymers like that. Cross-link polymers are stronger and tougher than other polymers. For example, your car tires are heavily cross-linked. And then you can have network polymers where the polymers are bonding like crazy with any polymer that crosses its path. And these are very, very tough um, and resistant to wear. Branched polymers, we talked about these, but branched polymers can have a main chain with one or more substituent side chains or branches, and then they can have all kinds of really, really fun, interesting shapes that lead to different properties. So some examples of this, types of branched polymers, star polymers coming off like that, make little stars, comb polymers looking like a comb, brush polymers coming off either side, dendronized polymers, ladders, dendromers, they all form these different structures, and because they have these different physical structures, they have different properties. Now, configuration is different from conformation. They often get confused, but they are actually different. The conformation, as we discussed, can change without bond breaking. It can just rotate within the bond. However, the configuration, in order to change that, you do have to break the bond. So one example of that is a stereoisomer. So for example, this has the same chemical formula, but the side group is on a different side. It's kind of a mirror image of itself. Okay, so here we've got our side chain, this little R group on this side, and here it's on the top. So stereoisomers are mirror images, and you can't um, superimpose or change one to another without actually breaking the bond. The tacticity of a polymer um, is the stereoregularity or the spatial arrangement of your side groups along the chain. An isotactic polymer has all the groups on the same side of the chain. That's shown here. All our little side groups are on the bottom. Syndiotactic polymers have the side groups on alternating sides, so it goes um, back and forth. Atactic groups have the groups positioned very randomly, so there's no predicting where any one is going to be. 
Um, another thing to remember is the cis and trans notation or, or uh, words that I introduced earlier. When it's a cis, um, then they're on the same side. The side groups are on the same side. If they're on trans, then they're on opposite sides. And this can change um, some of the physical properties of the polymer as well. So for example, cis isoprene is natural rubber. Trans isoprene, also natural, but they're positioned on different sides of the chains and they have different physical properties. More vocabulary to throw at you. Copolymers are when you take two different monomers and you polymerize them together. So you have two different groups. For example, like you might have a polyethylene and a polypropylene, and then you polymerize those two and they can go um, together. You can do this randomly. So you might have different monomers attached in different amounts. You can alternate. So you go, you know, propylene, ethylene, propylene, ethylene like that. Or you can do it in blocks where you have a big block of polypropylene and hooked to a big block of polyethylene and so on and so forth. And then finally you can do it in a graft so that you have, say for example, your polyethylene chain grafted to side chains of polypropylene. Um, crystallinity in polymers, um, it's, it's uh, most polymers are not crystalline, but you can get semi-crystalline um, polymers or crystallinity in various regions of the polymer. So, of course, for a crystalline structure, you have to have an ordered atomic arrangement with the molecular chains. So they have to pack together nicely and sit next to one another in a regular, um, uh, regular array. So here you can see this is sort of a little simulation or cartoon of polyethylene uh, chains kind of nested and sitting one next to one another in a regular way. In order for this to happen, what has to happen is the chains kind of have to bend and fold and line up in these nice little straight lines like that. Then a crystalline region is formed. Now because this is really difficult to do, most polymers are rarely 100% crystalline. It's actually very difficult to get them to align like that. And so what will happen is that you'll have typically these regions of crystallinity and in between the regions of crystallinity you'll have these amorphous kind of crazy spaghetti regions. Okay. What that means is that um, they usually express the degree of crystallinity in a polymer, sometimes a percent crystallinity, and the different properties of the polymer can depend upon what percent crystallinity they have. If you want to heat treat your polymer, then that can cause the crystalline regions to actually grow and the percent crystallinity to increase. When the crystallinity happens, it usually happens in these little thin platelets like you see, and that happens, the chain kind of bends back and forth on itself, forming these regular arrays um, within the little platelet. This is the chain folded structure. Here's an electron micrograph of what these little platelets look like. This is for polyethylene. And this is actually a single crystal. This only happens if you're willing to put in the time, slow and carefully controlled growth rates. More common is a semi-crystalline polymer with these uh, crystalline regions uh, surrounded by the amorphous regions. Sometimes the growth of these things looks really cool, like these little um, sphere-like growths here, where you have a nucleation site where it crystals and it crystallizes and it grows out from there in these little legs. Um, it kind of looks like dandelion fluff when it does that. Um, so that, that's common for some crystalline polymers. And here's a picture of it. This is uh, spherulites and polyethylene. This was actually imaged. Here's a 100 micrometer scale bar. So this is a visible light micrograph. But what they did was um, they put it between two cross polarizers and had the light pass through that way. Um, of course, remember, when you have crossed uh, polarized light, it can show up as uh, contrast in there and give you contrast into some of the stresses uh, and crystalline structures of the material. We saw that earlier. Okay, well, I hope you enjoyed that, learned a little something extra about polymers, and please watch uh, some of those Crash Course Chemistry videos. They're awesome.